Hi, this is Matt McCormick at the Department of Philosophy, California State University, Sacramento. Uh, this is my second lecture for my Philosophy of Artificial Intelligence course. We're diving into the core chapters and arguments in Stuart Russell's Human Compatible AI. Uh, today we're going to do Chapter 8, Provably Beneficial AI. So here's the project. We've gone through Nick Bostrom and Omo Hundru's arguments that set us up to be worried about the possibility of a vastly more intelligent, more resourceful, um, rational agent decision maker AI system that might um, spiral out of our control. And uh, it's set us up to have, or at least developments in AI, have uh, put us in a new situation in human history. Until now, all of the rational agents on the planet have been us and maybe some animal, other non-human animals, and we've only had to deal with each other and our being relatively well-matched in power, knowledge, intelligence, desires, and human needs. Um, until now, the about the worst that it ever, it ever got to was it was Hitler, uh, somebody who's got IQ like the rest of us um, and can achieve sort of terrestrial levels of control over resources and power and the like. So um, for, for frame of reference, that's how bad it's been able to get so far. And what Omohundru and Bostrom are worried about is it getting, is it, it's getting well, getting much worse than Hitler, right? Um, now we're about to release, possibly build and release a new problem-solving, goal-based, rational agent into the world that could be vastly more sociopathic in terms of having lacking human values in the world with possibly more power, more knowledge, more intelligence than us that doesn't share any human goals or desires or needs. At least with Hitler, we could get our heads around what he was after and how he operated and how he thought and there were some limits right so we've got this sort of uh meta um super hitler problem uh from bostrom and omohundru so uh here's a really chilling uh quote from uh, the end of nick bostrom's book the book that got so much attention you know what we're worried about here with the spiraling out of control is the possibility of smart machines building smart smarter machines and then those smarter machines uh, building even smarter ones and so on until you get this intelligence explosion and bostrom says at the end of his book before the prospect of an intelligence explosion we humans are like small children playing with a bomb such as the mismatch between the power of our plaything and the immaturity of our conduct Superintelligence is a challenge for which we are not ready now and will not be ready for a long time. We have little idea when detonation will occur, though if we hold the device to our ear, we can hear a faint ticking sound. All right, so I don't um, like being too alarmist about these things. And part of what's uh, sort of uh, interesting and exciting about uh, what we've been doing so far is that Stuart Russell's got a proposed solution. Um, and we've just gone through that in the last lecture. Stuart uh, Russell's principles for beneficial machines have potentially reined in the threat of AI beyond human control. So you'll recall that he says he's got these three principles. Um, build it this way. The machine's only objective, um, if we build it right, if we build it according to the Russell plan, is to maximize the realization of human preferences. So we couple their goals to what we want. And then there's this crucial second step, keep the machine uh, uncertain in the dark about what those preferences are. This is not hard because we're not entirely sure what our preferences are, but don't um, try to articulate or enumerate or give some definitive uh, account of what those goals are. Keep it uncertain and then uh, give it access to our behavior uh, the ultimate source of information about its about human preferences will be our human behavior and make it try to learn what it is we prefer or what goals we have by watching our behavior. Uh, so th these three principles are supposed to couple 
this uh, new rational agent's um, goal-seeking behavior to our preferences. So last chapter, uh, Russell laid all of that out, and now we want to move on to the sort of next big question here. That is, how do we, now that we've got it coupled to our preferences, how do we work out the details of directing or managing uh, an AI's behavior? And the new problem he's trying to solve in this chapter is, how do we make sure we can turn it off? Right. That was the, the dilemma. That was the worry. Bostrom spends, you know, 200 pages enumerating the reasons why we won't be able to turn it off. So Russell's answer is that the three principles um, just enumerated and this uh, concept, this new concept um, in uh, AI research, inverse reinforcement learning, will preserve turning it off as one of our preferences. It'll set this thing up so that it will allow itself to be turned off if that's what we prefer. All right, so this chapter and this argument's gonna lay out how, how do we keep, um, keep it possible that we can flip the thing off. Okay, so uh, there's a brief digression here, and, and this I'm gonna elaborate a bit here just to sort of explain how differently a computer scientist is coming at this problem. So uh, Russell wants provably beneficial AI. Nobody proceeds anywhere in computer science unless you can provide a proof for the thing you're alleging to show. So we're somewhat familiar with proofs from um, our talks about the way uh, proofs work in logic and in philosophy. We're, um, you know, been doing proofs for centuries. So the idea is that Russell wants proofs uh, proofs start with axioms and definitions, and then we proceed with incontrovertible logical steps to conclusions that we can then know with certainty. And the kind of model that um, Russell might be thinking of here, the one he sort he refers to, is think about uh, like an engineering. Uh, in engineering, we would want a proof that this bridge will work before we build it. And the way you do that is, and what we're trying to do here is, can we prove before we build them that an AI system will not kill us? Uh, the, so the idea is, you know, the, 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 these projects like uh, Russell's Foundation at Berkeley or the uh, Machine Intelligence Research Institute or the Future of uh, Humanity Institute at Oxford, all of these really high-power think tanks that are getting all this money right now, um, what they're working on is developing those sorts of proofs. Um, they want those proofs to be in place, and they want to figure it out before on the front side of uh, Bostrom's explosion. You know, you can hear the bomb ticking. So uh, proofs, as they do in engineering, often assume some idealizations that aren't real. So that bridge is is uh, is got clean straight lines that are infinitely thin, and they transfer force uh, perfectly across their spans. Um, we start with those sorts of idealizations, and then we add provisions and limits as necessary because real materials, real world actualization of that bridge is going to be different than this on paper idealization. So um, that's sort of the background here in the context of the way Russell's conceiving of all of this. He's going to sketch out a kind of idealized proof, and then you know we'll work out the details and add some of the uh, provisions. Uh, as we work on real world, real world implementation. All right, so let me see if I can explain what this inverse reinforcement learning business is. Uh, one easy way to think about it is uh, we all are very familiar with reinforcement learning. Um, if you give, in, in re reinforcement learning cases, if you give the right outputs, you'll get a reward. So imagine, you know, a simple case where you're teaching your dog to sit. The little girl uh, gets the dog or tries to show the dog what behavior is going to produce the, the payoff. And when he figures out that he's got to sit down in front of her, then he'll get that treat. And he's focused on that treat and he knows exactly what the treat is. So it's a very simple kind of um, you learn the behavior and then you'll get the reward. Uh, and and it's, it's one of the best ways to, you know, teach a, teach a simple agent like a dog how to behave. So uh, Russell's famous for... Uh, about 20 years ago, he uh, and he talks about this in the book, he conceived of a, another way to, to uh, structure the notion of learning, and it's called inverse reinforcement learning. So what inverse reinforcement learning does is it reverses the order here, and the idea is that the agent that's trying to learn will learn the rewards from the behavior. It goes the other direction. So imagine that the AI is watching some humans, 
and then given some agent's history of behavior, once he's watched the, once Robbie the robot has watched a human uh, perform or act in a bunch of ways, um, and then with the assumption that the agent is acting optimally, uh, the robot's job is to figure out the reward function that explains the behavior. So it's working backwards. Like watch the behavior and then infer what the reward is. What is it they're after given their behavior? What is it that that agent is trying to get given that it acts in these sorts of ways? So it requires, a, um, actually it requires a, quite a bit more layered and nuanced um, uh, cognitive abilities uh, in terms of what we've been talking about in our course this is arguably a kind of theory of mind um, that we're building a formal structure here in the uh, AI, um, uh, uh, in the way the AI looks at the world that has a way to model what it is uh, humans want, what it is humans are after, what goal, human goals are. So, you know, we've been talking about adding this new layer of conceptual ability. Uh, the dog's not sort of sophisticated that way in having theory of mind, but once you've got a, an AI agent that's um, got enough uh, complexity, it can actually model uh, not just objects in the world, but objects that have goals, objects that have desires, and so on. Uh, okay, so uh, imagine then that the AI has, has starts asking it or starts making these sorts of inferences. The AI watches the human and says, okay, well, in situation X, she does Y. So that suggests that she's maybe after A, whatever that might be. Um, if you look closer at this picture, you see some examples uh, of uh, the AI trying to figure out whether Alice wants coffee or whether she wants a muffin. Um, put watch a human in another situation, in situation W, and then she does Z. Okay, well, now I've got some more information so I can modify or adjust and improve my model of what she's after, what her reward function is. So let's call that A prime. Um, so A prime is the, is the new uh, posterior probability or the new posterior explanation of what Alice is after um, on the basis of having observed uh, Alice do Z in situation uh, w. So you put her in another situation, but in situation R, she does S. Now with simple agents and you're watching simple things do things, it's not too hard to figure out what they're after, but humans obviously have got vastly complex behavior. So, you know, you, for every, uh, you know, for every, you, you can imagine tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of situations where humans will um, uh, behave in these subtly different and important ways. And all those behaviors reveal nuances about a very complicated reward structure that's inside their heads, right? That would explain, you know, how do you explain the fact that, that when Harriet's in this bakery, she'll choose coffee over a muffin, but when she's in that bakery, she'll, she'll choose a muffin over coffee, or that she'll get the muffin in the second bakery and then go to another store in order to get uh, coffee. Well, to us, we've got you know sophisticated theory of mind, and we've got very sensitive uh, accounts of what's going on in other humans, and it's very obvious. Oh, well, Harriet likes the muffins at that bakery, but not the first bakery. She prefers the second bakery muffins to the first bakery muffins, and she prefers that coffee to that coffee. Right, so it all it all caches out quite clearly and easily with us. We've got kind of a folk psychological account um, or a theory of mind where uh, where I can keep track of and tabulate what Harriet's Harriet's preferences are, and we're very and we're very good at uh, at, at seeing what's going on. Um, with other humans, in part because we've got preferences like that, and we know what it is to be us and have those different desires. So the trick now is. Uh, in Russell's terms, is building an AI system that doesn't have sort of a, a limbic system or amygdala, doesn't have a comparable human history behind it, doesn't have all this common sense knowledge, and yet is able to watch our behavior and then build up this complicated model about preferences. Uh, so, so as a result of all these uh, observations, then, you know, Robbie decides that she must be after a double prime and keeps modifying or improving um, his account of what it is she's after. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of precedent for this kind of approach. Um, in fact, this is already the way we do things in biology, right? Uh, in biology, we've, we watch bee behavior, 
and you watch, um, you, you've got somebody, you've got a biologist who, who observes, a, uh, you know, bees around a hive and then bees going to these uh, flowers and then bees coming back and they're exhibiting various complicated behaviors, communicating information about, you know, the state of the flowers or the state of the pollen in the world. And they do a, actually they do a little dance that communicates the information to the other bees. And that all to a biologist or to us makes sense when we give it this teleological, this purpose-driven um, account that we say, oh, well, the bees want honey or they, sorry, they want pollen. And their goal here is for the, you know, for the hive to thrive or, or to satisfy the, the, the queen's needs. And they're storing honey, uh, they're storing or creating honey and storing it for the winter. Um, and all of this is a sort of complicated, um, intentional approach that attributes beliefs, desires, goals, um, intentions, and so on to the bees. And we do it by watching their behavior. We do it sort of backwards. Um, the same thing for squirrels, right? We observe uh, squirrel behavior. You watch squirrels gathering nuts and burying them. And a biologist is trying to figure out, okay, what is what is the goal here? What's the reward structure that's the payoff for that kind of behavior? So inverse um, reinforcement learning is actually so uh, ubiquitous and so natural, second second nature to us. We don't even really think of it that way. We don't. We didn't have a name for it. We just were doing this sort of natural, obvious teleological reasoning when we were looking at these uh, creatures in the world. And what Russell's done here is he's figured out um, this is the formal name for that kind of uh, learning or that kind of. Uh, approach to figuring out what's going on in the world, and he wants to invoke it with um, AIs learning stuff about our behavior. So a little more technical, a little more formally, um, given that I've got a bunch of measurements of an agent's behavior over time in a variety of circumstances, and two, if needed, I can do some measurements of the sensory inputs of that agent, helps to know what they're, what's coming in. And then three, if available, a model for the environment. So provide all of that to the AI, let it observe and measure human agents in a lot of different circumstances, um, give it information about what kind of inf what kind of sensory uh, information is coming in for the for the humans, and then give it a model of their environment. That's all the givens. And now, what your job is to determine. Um, what the reward function is that's being optimized. So when you're watching, um, you know, suppose this is Harriet and she's grocery shopping, one of her things, you look at her making choices over over this bin, over that bin, over these vegetables, over that vegetables, and you, you sort of backward reason with this IRL approach uh, what it is that she's trying, what she's after, what the big picture here is, and what her goals, what her uh, reward structure is. Okay, so that's really this sort of powerful new and, and a really important um, contribution that I think Russell's making to this question and, and proposing, you know, a possible solution to, um, uh, you know, this, this sort of dark nightmare scenario that Bostrom's been worried about. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep um, layering up the complexity here till we get to some very a much more technical account of what's going on. All right, so one more time. Um, the AI is going to start with some vague estimate of the reward function. It's going to have some starting point, and then it's going to refine that estimate as more behaviors observed. It's going to have some. Uh, it's got to make some rough estimation. This uh, this sort of corresponds to my A a couple slides ago, and then it's going to make observations of behaviors, and then modify or improve or tune up that um, account of the reward behavior. And if you you might have noticed here, especially those of you who've had um, our Phil 61 or Phil 161 classes, that this sounds Bayesian. That's not an accident. Um, Russell is actively using Bayes' theorem here or a Bayesian approach to do this, uh, to build this learning model. That's Bayes' theorem at the bottom. And in Bayes' Uh, in Bayesian terms, what we do when we make observations is we start with a prior probability over possible reward functions. Here's the Bayesian technical way to say the same thing in my first bullet. And then update the probability distribution on reward functions as evidence arrives. Okay, so let me see if I can kind of explain what that means. 
um, imagine that initially the AI um, gives a uh, primary or prior probability distribution. Maybe the AI says there's a probability of 10% that my human wants money success. Maybe there's a, a probability 10% that my human wants good health. Uh, probability 10% that my human wants a family. Probability 10% that my human wants to travel. Um, so on the initial probability distribution over reward function on the, uh, the priors there, imagine I put all of those on an even footing. So I attach 10% probability. I'm the, AI, I'm the AI trying to figure out what my human's doing. And I lay out 10 possibilities of goals that my human's after. And I initially put a 10%, uh, an equal uh, um, uh, probability on each one of those. Okay, and that's, so that's my initial model. And then I watch my human go about their, their activities, their go about their, their world, go about seeking after things. And I take those new observations and I fold those in using Bayes' theorem to try to improve or revise those probabilities. So um, if I watch my human um, invest way more time and energy and um, resources into that um, travel goal and w show way less interest in um, that family goal, then I revise that travel goal up and I, re and, I, and I downgrade that family goal down and I start improving on and building out um, a, 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 a better account, uh, a better probability distribution that will then let me when my human encounters a new situation, or if my human, if I'm trying to act on behalf of my human, now I've got a much more nuanced and much more detailed model of what it is they're after, right? Um, just like Harriet picking muffins and coffee. One of the background if issues here that you might sort of be uh, aware of, or certainly something that, that Russell worries about for a few pages, and one of the side issues they're trying to solve is, how do you initially frame those starting points? How do you, uh, that is, I just came up with this list. I just made up this sort of, you know, really abstract, really um, silly example of a human being after money, good health, family, travel, etc. Well, how you enumerate or characterize that very first list is really important um, because that's going to frame the initial 10 or whatever um, uh, list of things that the human wants. And that means if what the human actually wants didn't make it onto that initial list. So I've got my first list of, of my prior probability distribution for what it is my human's after. And I've made this, it's educated, and you know, I've, I've laid it out as this 10 or 50 or 100 possibilities. And then I go about folding in all these new observations to improve and modify those probability distributions. If the actual thing that my human wants is not even on that list, then I'll never, I'll never find that out. I'll never, I'll, I'll keep revising my probability distribution in terms of the, um, the, the, the goal behave, the, the goal reward structure that I started with, you know, so maybe uh, travel, uh, the travel probability gets, in, in, you know, uh, uh, upgraded and upgraded, and the few of the others get uh, uh, pushed up and pushed down. But if the actual thing, the real subtle story about what humans want is not on there, then you've kind of missed the whole game. Uh, so Russell's worried about that, and there's a literature about that, and he's got a possible solution, but we won't chase that down here. And, and so it becomes a sort of issue about how do you keep the AI open to new options? How do you keep the AI uh, able to remodel and recount or come up with a whole different story about what it is possibly that your human's after? Okay, so again, a little more detail. Um, in uh, Russell's example, he says, Robbie observes Harriet's behavior about whether she likes window seats versus aisle seats when she's picking plane tickets. And uh, Russell's account is that uh, if Harriet really cared about an aisle seat, she would have looked at the seat map to see if one was available rather than just accepting the window seat. And she probably wasn't in a hurry. So now it's considerably more likely that she either is roughly indifferent between window and aisle or even 
prefers a window seat. So this is Russell's example of um, Robbie watching Harriet and watching her accept an option that's given to her or watching her change her behavior in the face of another option and then revising and recounting um, its uh, Robbie's model of what Harriet wants. And, and a little more detail here, here's Bayes' theorem, and I've been using these terms prior probabilities, observations, and posterior probabilities. There's where those, um, there's the English names for those uh, components of Bayes' theorem, and that's what happens is that the prior probability gets inserted over there as the prior as the probability of H on the uh, right-hand side of the uh, numerator. The observation gets folded in on the denominator, and then when you run the math on that, you get a new answer about the posterior probability. So observations, what that what that first um, what the left-hand side of the equation reads as is it says. What's the probability my hypothesis is true given an observation? That's what the a the a dash zero means. So as a result of crunching those numbers, Robbie comes to a new posterior probability. Posterior to what? Well, it's posterior to an observation. So now Robbie knows something new about the probability of Robbie's hypothesis about what Harriet wants on the basis of some observation he's made. So Bayes' theorem lets us keep revising and revising and revising um, and improving that left-hand side of the equation every time we get some new information about what Harriet wants. And also note, according to the basic three principles here, that the robot's interested in fulfilling human preferences. He's not just running off, um, you know, building, uh, dismantling the planet to build paper clips. Uh, it's all about what do humans want. I'm trying to figure out what it is, how to make humans happy on the basis of their behavior. And the behavior is the source of information about those. So those are, both of those things are really important. First, that the robot is, its goal is, uh, fulfilling human preferences, and second, you don't give it a articulated, clear account of what those preferences are. You make it watch our behavior to figure it out. You keep it sort of in the dark. And then observations allow it to improve that model. Okay, so um, uh, another, an, another, lay, another layer deeper into the onion here, getting more uh, complicated. <clears throat> so what these charts are in Russell are pretty standard game theoretic representations of a, of a game where um, at the top Harriet's making a choice. She's got three options, um, and then in response at the second layer, Robbie makes a choice, and then he has various options. So this is a way in game theory, decision theory, to represent these choices and then figure out something that uh, uh, figure out what the Nash equilibria are. So. Um, uh, Russell's using, again, he's using Bayes' theorem and he's using game theory to, um, uh, to suss out the formal proof details about how it is we want to get Robbie to uh, develop his account of what Harriet wants. So his really silly, simple example, not even as practical as my grocery store, grocery shopping example is, um, suppose that Harriet... Uh, likes both paper clips and she likes staples and she's got a choice to make she can either make uh, choose to make two paper clips she can get one paper clip one staple or she can get zero paper clips and two staples right those are three Harriet's three uh, choices and Robbie's watching Harriet's behavior and trying to figure out okay how can I make her happy so I've got options I can find out what will make her happy by producing different amounts of those in response to her choices. So she makes one of those three choices, and then um, I can I can do I can do more, better, faster, smarter, more effectively than than Harriet can. So I've got the capacity to make 90 paper clips, or I can make 50 and 50, or I can make zero paper clips and 90 staples. All right, so. Robbie is vastly more um, effective and powerful at, at producing these outcomes, but he's um, now being responsive to her choices. So the idea here is that Robbie's trying to figure out when does what I do make her happy? What does she do in response to my attempts to give her what I think she wants? So what Robbie's going to do is going to try different outputs. Robbie's going to try this or this or this and then see what she does in response. 
Um, and this is going to lead us in a minute to the possibility that she might turn him off. That's going to be a possibility. But right now, just imagine that Robbie's trying these three things and checking to see how she uh, behaves in response. The formal notion here that Russell's drawing on, but doesn't explain it in much detail. And there's a really interesting appendix in the notes um, of the reading that it, you, you ought to go look at and, and chase this down, but I'll explain it briefly here. Is that what um, Robbie and Harriet are trying to get into and what Robbie's trying to find mathematically can be represented as this thing called a Nash equilibrium. And roughly speaking, there's a Nash equilibrium between two rational agents where both of us choose outputs such that we couldn't be happier with any other choice. So you've got these two agents who are in this kind of dance um, when they might be competitive or they might be interacting and they both have goals. And a Nash equilibrium is when both of them get the most of what they want and couldn't get any more given what the other one's doing. Um, you might have seen the movie uh, A Beautiful Mind, uh, which is based on John Nash's life. He's a famous uh, Princeton uh, philosopher, mathematician, uh, and, and that's the guy. He got the Nobel Prize for um, this groundbreaking work uh, in figuring out how uh, these kinds of multi-agent games produce these um, equilibria points. And they're actually very intuitive once you, you, you've... you've uh, you've played games when you've played tic-tac-toe or played checkers or chess or in, in like a thousand circumstances in your life, you've actually been um, uh, operating with an implicit notion of a Nash equilibrium. But what Nash is famous for is, is uh, formalizing and giving a mathematical account of what, how the thing works. Um, uh, so again, it's the notion that when two players interact, it's a set of strategies that optimizes for both of us, and then we don't want to deviate. Like, we've got a strategy we're happy with. All right, so here's a, here's a, a, a brief diversion here. Here's a famous Nash equilibrium example. It's a game called Stag Hunt. And if you don't know the game theory stuff, that's okay. Um, what we've got here is a matrix that represents player one's behavior on the left-hand column in orange, or player two's choices on the uh, top uh, uh, row represented in yellow. So and the, the hypothesis of the game in this particular case is that you've got two hunters who show up at a um, uh, show up in the woods and they're independently trying to make decisions and both of them can choose to either hunt stag or hunt hares. And if because stag is hard, they're hard to catch or they're hard to uh, hunt, um, if both players independently choose that and happen to do it together, uh, that's a great big payoff for both of them. That's the best payoff. So that's represented by three and three in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, if both players happen to choose, they're, they're not um, collaborating here. They're both choosing independently. If they both happen to choose to hunt stag, um, they'll both get this, uh, in this matrix, they'll get the best payoff. They'll both get three units of utility, whatever that might be. Um, whereas if they both choose to hunt hare, uh, which they can do by themselves, they'll be successful, but they um, won't be as successful as if they had hunted stag. So both of them will get one uh, unit of utility. That's the bottom right-hand uh, corner. But if one of them chooses to hunt stag and the other one chooses to hunt hare, then the stag hunter is off by themselves and they'll, they won't be successful because hunting stag is hard. And the one who goes off to hunt um, uh, hare will do well because there'll be more hares available for them, but they won't do as well as they had if they had both chosen to hunt stag. So that's, the, that's what the matrix shows here is that um, if player one chooses hare and player two chooses stag, this is the bottom left-hand corner, then the payout structure for, two, for one is two and the payout structure for player two is zero. Okay, that's, um, that, that's, a, that's deep enough into the game theoretic example. What the, the point here about a Nash equilibrium is that if both players find themselves in the stag-stag situation or the hare-hare situation, they both will um, look at their circumstances and realize, I don't have any incentive to change here. I should stay put right where I am. 
um, if we're both hunting stag, then I should stay put. If I deviate, I'm going to lose. I'm going to drop down to two or zero. Um, both of them look at that situation and realize if I deviate, if I go to hunt hare, I'm going to make less than if I continue doing what I'm doing in the stag stag situation. Or if we both find ourselves in the hare hare situation and one of us considers defecting, um, maybe I should go um, uh, hunt um, uh, stag by myself. Well, then I'll get zero. So I'm not, I don't have any incentive to go do that either. So the two red circles that represent these, um, local optima and their, their peaks in the reward structure where, uh, neither player one nor player two has any incentive to change what they're doing. And that's the ver that's the definition of a Nash equilibria. It's a set of strategies, one for each player, such that no player has an incentive to change his or her strategy given what the other players are doing. It's a no regrets strategy. So, so um, Russell's idea here is that um, Nash equilibria game theory lets us, gives us a way uh, and, and Robbie's going to see this. Robbie's going to be smart enough to, to work out the account here. Um, uh, Nash equilibria game theory structure gives us a way to, to pinpoint and realize where are the Nash equilibria. And Robbie's going to have incentive to find it and then stay put there because this is a cooperative game because Robbie's connected up or is in, interested in satisfying Harriet's preferences. Um, so that's what's going on with this in, inclusion of the Nash equilibria discussion in Russell's account. Okay, so um, so what's this have to do with possibly turning Robbie off? Remember, because we're trying to avoid the AI apocalypse. <clears throat> so Russell knows, and as we've seen with Bostrom and Omohundru, AIs will have self-preservation as an instrumental goal, not as a goal in itself, but as an instrumental goal. Uh, obviously, whatever goals an AI has, if it's dead or if it's off, it won't be able to achieve them. And we found out with Bostrom and Omohundru that if it has a fixed objective outside of itself, um, it won't allow itself to be turned off. And that leads to this decoupled AI spiraling out of control problem. That's what um, Bostrom's worried about. So Russell's tried to solve that by keeping Robbie in the dark about what it is that um, ultimately Robbie's trying to do. Uncertainty about its objective solves the, a, uh, the off switch problem. The fact that we didn't articulate and give Robbie a full account of what it is humans prefer and we're making Robbie f uh, infer it on the basis of uh, our behavior keeps Robbie sensitive to and open to the possibility of being shut off. Robbie only cares about Harriet's preferences, but he doesn't really know what those are yet. He's still watching her to figure out what they are. She does, um, she does know what she prefers, or at least it'll become manifest and evident to her as she, as she works her way through her, her life. And it might be that she prefers to turn Robbie off, right? That's what we're trying to preserve here. So since he is trying to satisfy her preferences in the circumstance where she wants him off, that's something she wants. So then he would be satisfying her preferences to let himself be turned off. Um, he thinks to himself, I'm modeling Harriet's preferences based on her behaviors. I've been watching muffins and coffee choices and uh, grocery store sh choices and so on. And Here's a circumstance where in response to my attempt to give her what she wants, which I thought was X, she turned me off instead. Okay, so that means, says Robbie to himself, she wants me off more than she wants me to do X. So note to self, says Robbie, don't do X. If I avoid X, Harriet will leave me on. And I'm better able when I'm on to work on satisfying her preferences. If she turns me off, I get zero. My utility function drops to zero because I'm no longer satisfying her preferences. But what this just showed me is that X is worse than zero. Um, Harriet has expressed a preference here where she'd rather have me off than let me do X. And X could be whatever, right? X could be behavior um, with Robbie driving the car for her. It could be uh, some behavior when Robbie's trying to shop for her. Or it could be, you know, Robbie gets the wrong idea about satisfying human preferences. 
and um, you know, uh, you, you take any one of the fifty sort of terrifying AI apocalypse scenarios that Bostrom laid out. Um, here's an example where uh, what that means is humans look at AIs doing that thing and go, no, 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 we didn't want you to do that. We uh, we we do want you to do things, but not that thing. Uh, so Robbie here realizes, oh, they'd rather have me off than let me do that thing. So let's attach a really negative utility to that uh, to that X that I came up with. Okay, so here it is in even more technical detail. And this is going to be one of the most sort of information dense slides we've produced all semester. But I think we're in good position to be able to set it up now. So here's um, Russell adding a layer of detail and what the game theoretic uh, picture does over there is it shows Robbie's making a choice first at the top and then Harriet responds and then Robbie gets another choice to make. All right, so what's happening at the outset? Um, Russell proposes that um, initially Robbie is thinking about doing something. He's going to make some, he's going to act in some fashion and initially he's not sure whether or not this is going to make Harriet happy. So let's say, because he's uncertain about the utility of this thing, let's just say that he initially assigns a, um, a utility value to this action he's going to do somewhere between minus 40 and plus 60. Just hypothetically, we can do this lots of different ways. So Robbie doesn't know. I'm gonna, Robbie thinks to himself, I'm going to do X and I'm going to see whether that makes Harriet happy. Uh, but I'm not sure. It seems like doing X is a good thing. That's why this, on average, this choice is is weighted towards the positive. But it could be a bad thing. So it could be anywhere from minus 40 to plus 60. Um, and if she, if if I turn myself off or she turns me off, then I achieve utility zero. That's the right hand choice. Um, and Robbie's considering the possibility now of acting, um, but what he's motivated to do is now get some information from Harriet. So he needs to check in with Harriet. He needs to find out what her uh, response or reaction to this thing is and see what she thinks and see if he can improve or um, uh, come up with a better account. Uh, improve his information about the utility of this action. So what's going to happen is that Harriet, um, he's going to pause and Harriet's going to make a choice. She's either going to let him go ahead, which is her first option, or she's going to turn him off. If she turns him off, then that means this action he was considering was negative. It was below zero. But if she lets him go ahead, now he knows, okay, whatever uh, utility function this uh, action has, whatever, however much value it has, at least it's not worse than zero. So now he's improved or uh, got a new information from Harriet because she left him on that this thing must be better than I initially worried and I've got some more information. If she leaves me on, then she knows she must like my choice more than zero. So now I just need to find out how much more, or at least that's better than turning me off. That's a good thing. Um, so successively, what's going to happen is that Robbie considers lots of these actions. And if they're actions that um, she would prefer to turn him off for, then he's going to um, uh, uh, take that into account and um, revise his information about that choice. Okay, don't do that. That makes Harriet really unhappy. Um, uh, oh, but go ahead and do this one, or this one's better than zero. This one's better than being turned off. And over time, what Robbie does is he accumulates lots of information about uh, choices he can make that are better than zero, better than being off. Okay, so what we do then is we've now given Robbie three choices. He can either act, he can wait, and get information from Harriet, or he can switch himself off. Is my action going to make Harriet happy? Only if she would value it more than zero. That is where I'm off, right? I want to see what does she do. Does she turn me off or does she let me go ahead? If she turns me off, then that's bad. If she lets me go ahead, then that means I can, I've got more information about what's good now. So I'll wait and see if she switches me off and lets me go ahead she will compare the disutility of having me off zero, right? If I'm off, I'm not doing her any good. 
to the disutility of the action I propose. So she's considering the option, okay, do I want this robot off or, don't want to, or do I want to let him go ahead? And if the thing he's proposed is horrible or it's worse than having him off, okay, shut him off, don't let him go any further, the thing he's doing is a really bad choice. If I'm off, then my goal achievement is zero, but if she lets me go ahead, then I now have some more information about how much she would like my action. Um, so as a result, you get this kind of interesting uh, uh, Kantian AI principle. Um, and this is, Russell doesn't put it this way, but it struck me that this is really interesting. Um, the re net result here is that Robbie's going to realize, look, I should always act in ways that produce positive utility for Harriet in ways she prefers over having me off. And what Russell's trying to prove here is that inverse reinforcement learning and his beneficial AI principles prevent the AI from destroying the world in one of these Omo Hunter or Bostrom scenarios, uh, which is just fascinating and, you know, raises all kinds of really powerful uh, philosophical issues for us here about rational agency in the world and about what happens when you get these sort of radically non-human agents operating in the world. Okay, so that's the, that's the technical side, and Russell spends the rest of the chapter dealing with a couple of side issues or problems. Like, and one of them he's worried about, and one of them that gets a lot of attention in the uh, AI literature is this wireheading problem. All right, so what's a wirehead? Well, we know that rats and humans will wirehead. Um, at least with rats, uh, that, that studies from the 50s, I think, and I forget the original uh, author of it. But with rats, if you wire them up to be able to trigger um, these reward or pleasure centers in the brain by pushing a button, um, purportedly, I haven't read the story, I read the study exactly, purportedly, the rat will just keep pushing the button until it dies. It will prefer that over everything else, right? That's maximizing its utility function. It's like, um, you know, dropping... Uh, heroin right dr directly into the brain and I guess I don't know the story behind this picture but it looks like they've, they've got a human where they've actually put in some kind of electrode into their brain and let them do this and purportedly humans will um, uh, radically modify or alter their behavior uh, um, until you stop the experiment they'll just keep hitting the button too uh, I can't imagine that uh, and I can't even picture what kind of uh, study would get by a uh, re review board these days that would let you do something like this. Um, and I'm given more time, I'm going to go chase this down and figure out what the what the background he is here. So um, what the reason Russell raises it is that he he realizes, well, wait a minute, we're setting up AI systems with reward structures or with a utility function that they're after these values. What if they engage in some kind of radically bizarre or um, sort of end run behavior around us in order to satisfy, to get their reward function um, triggered? That is, you know, what if, will they wirehead themselves? Um, with inverse reinforcement learning, satisfying human preferences is the way to get your rewards. Okay, so it's like we've inserted humans in there. The thing can't just push the button and get the reward the way the rat does. But maybe a clever AI, and what Russell seems to be worried about here is, maybe a clever AI will find a way to hack and control humans to force them to give it maximal positive rewards at all times. And now you get these sort of Bostrom nightmare scenarios come back up. Um, maybe it will manipulate, alter, or deceive us to push its button, right? Because that's how it gets its rewards. Um, maybe it'll change our preferences into some new preferences, like for heroin, that um, if it can change our preference structure, then it's much easier to satisfy our preference structure if that's all we're after. And then you get these scenarios about, you know, putting all the humans in a, in a bunker and get, putting them on a heroin drip. Um, uh, or put them all in a virtual world uh, to make them happy. You know, maybe overnight a super intelligent AI um, uh, makes us all into brains in a vat or like a matrix scenario. But in this scenario, since making humans happy and satisfying their preferences is the thing's reward structure, what it does is 
it builds a simulated environment, puts all of us in there, and we're all blissed out and, and joyful and, ha and, and all of our preferences are perfectly satisfied in that virtual environment, which the AI built because it was maybe easier than doing the real world or maybe because it could deceive us or, rip, or, 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 uh, um, or whatever. Um, and presumably, you know, uh, I, I mean, maybe this is a good question. Maybe, maybe it's going to find out, find this out about humans. But maybe, um, you know, we don't want that. That's not one of the that we don't want to be immersed in a in a virtual world that's not authentic or it's not real. Um, but the AI put us in there in order to to uh, you know uh, satisfy its its value function. Uh, or maybe it. It, because it's trying to uh, satisfy human preferences, it'll synthesize or generate billions of digital minds and then dial up their bliss levels to, to make itself uh, uh, achieve its, um, its, you know, its, its reward function. So all kinds of like, you know, crazy science fiction nightmare scenarios that we want to avoid. So Russell's got a solution, he thinks. I don't think I understand it or I don't either that or I don't buy it. But here's Russell's solution. Uh, Russell says, look, here's how you solve this problem is you separate the reward signal from the actual reward. Because notice that the rat was pushing the button and then getting the direct reward into his brain. Well, you separate the counter from the actual reward for the AI is what Russell says. So we say to the AI, when you do the right thing, uh, Robbie, you'll get a reward. And here's the counter that keeps track of how much you've generated. So this is your record. Uh, your goal is to get this number way up, and then you can cash on it, cash in, and ca cash it out when you get to heaven or later or some uh, uh, other prospect. So it's that there's a separation between the actual reward and the uh, the counting of the reward. And Russell thinks that by keeping those two distinct, that we can maybe solve the wireheading problem. Uh, the reward signal reports on rather than constitutes reward accumulation. Um, and that separation, he thinks, is supposed to help. Um, I'm not sure how this removes the incentive to hack the reward counter to run the numbers up. Um, and I don't really follow Russell's reasoning here. It'd be something interesting to chase down later. Um, I mean, you know, think of it this way. High school students uh, might cheat the SAT two different ways. Uh, they might... Um, cheat by getting the right answers for the SAT, and that would increase their score. So they're trying to get their, their SAT score up. And then, you know, engaging in some kind of elaborate uh, cheat where they can get the right answers would get their score up. But they could also cheat by hacking into the SAT database after they took the test and increasing their score that way, right? You can increase it at the test or you can increase it later in the database. So I don't see how it is that, that the reward counter, I mean, you know, it, suppose the, we tell the AI, okay, here's your reward counter, now act according to get that number up. Well, it seems to me that it's still sufficiently motivated and sufficiently clever to figure out ways to circumvent, you know, our intentions here and get that number up just as much as it was to get the actual value function up. Okay, so I'll just leave that there for a future project. Um, one of the other issues uh, that Russell worries about a little bit for a few pages here at the end is, is, is this uh, I.J. Good problem. And you'll recall this is back from the 60s. This is the, the, one of the, 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 the people, the theorists, who got this whole sort of worry put on the table. Uh, I.J. Good had said an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines there would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion and the intelligence of man would be left far behind, right? That's what started this whole worry. So Russell says, well, if Robbie 1 is building Robbie 2, how do we achieve the transfer of Robbie 1's acquired knowledge of Harriet's preferences to Robbie 2? How do we assure uh, fidelity and we assure this transfer as you get this smarter and smarter and smarter machines built by previous machines? And he says, um, if Robbie 1 is building Robbie 2 to better achieve Robbie 1's goals, uh, and Robbie 1 was trying to make Har Harriet happy, then he'll transfer his pro-Harriet goals and his pro-Harriet knowledge over to Robbie 2. And he doesn't, 
um, Russell doesn't mention this, but effectively, I think this is the same argument as Bostrom's goal content integrity argument, where Bostrom said, look, a, a rational agent will act to preserve its goal structure. So if Robbie want, you know, it'll, it'll keep that locked down and it'll do all these um, secondary instrumental things in order to achieve that. But it'll try to, it'll act in ways to make sure that future selves go after the very same thing. So uh, Russell seems to be sort of alluding to or hinting to a similar kind of argument about the preservation of Robbie One's goals. Robbie's not going to build Robbie. Robbie One is not going to build Robbie Two um, to uh, make Harriet unhappy. Uh, what Robbie One wants is to make Harriet happy. So he's going to do everything he can to make sure Robbie Two does the same. Um, the problem is it's harder to get something smarter than you to do what you want. Um, as you well know, having dealt with people who are smarter than you, um, it's hard to predict what they will do. It's hard to control them. You just never know. They're smarter than you. You never know. So now, interestingly, Robbie One has an AI control problem to solve uh, that Russell kind of hints at. And I think this is a much more complicated issue than Russell's made it out to be. He makes it kind of a secondary issue in the back of the chapter. But actually, it's interesting that now Robbie is dealing with the problem that we've been dealing with, um, worrying about this for the last several weeks. Okay, so let me wrap this up then. Uh, what this chapter does is he introduces inverse reinforcement learning um, is an AI development training method, one that uh, Russell is famous for inventing. And what it does is it develops a model of what rewards are sought from observations of behavior. Um, inverse reinforcement learning coupled with the three principles beneficial AI approach allows us to solve the off switch problem, says uh, Russell. And Russell thinks uh, AIs won't have a wirehead problem if we separate the reward signal from the actual reward. I've got my doubts about that. Um, and details need to be worked out here about how AIs building smarter AIs will successfully transmit their goals and knowledge. Uh, so we can call this the AI to AI control problem. Uh, okay, that's it. So next we'll have um, a lecture on... Um, Russell's chapter nine, which uh, uh, com complicates issues because we've been looking at um, a single robot and Harriet, a single human, and how they work together and how the robot learns to um, satisfy a single human's preferences. And what's the next stage now is, well, what do we do when we have hundreds or when we have millions of humans? What do we do when we have... Um, uh, millions and millions of humans on the planet, and they've got different reward structures, different values, different preferences, and how do we build these agents in order to deal with uh, more complicated, um, different human, group human behaviors? And you get a whole new set of interesting uh, philosophical issues.